So today's podcast, I have bubble tea and Dan doesn't. Well, I had bubble tea and you didn't. I, 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 mm, good bubble tea. I don't care. I have bubble tea <laughs> and you don't. That is our new podcast. I, I have about an inch of bubble. Mm. There's just no tea left. Mm. Well, I have bubble debris. The bubble debris. I finally found a bubble tea place I like here in Utah Valley. And I am happy because I was able to get bubble tea in Taiwan, obviously, uh, very well. And then there was a China, or a Japanese restaurant locally that was just had really good bubble tea. And then the Japanese restaurant burned down. That sucks. As they do, apparently. Um, and they <laughs> decided not to open up. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so let's let's give this one uh, some notoriety here. Is it Cha Cha or is it Ha Cha? So they have the worst branding. It's Chat Chat. Oh, you're kidding. I am not ch- kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Some graphic designer. Some graphic designer out there. Um, so they've replaced the C on the first one with something that might be a spoon. I'm not sure. I thought it was a shrimp. It, <laughs> why would it be a shrimp, Dan? <laughs> I, well, maybe they are a place that does bubble tea and like tempura. I don't okay. know. Okay. I haven't I, been there. I suppose. I suppose. That's, <laughs> that's not impossible. But they've also replaced the T's of the chat chat um, with... Um, Little icons of cups little with straws icons. in them. With, yes. And so... Yeah. Never would have occurred to me in a hundred years that those were teas. Emily and I were admiring this the other time we got it. Just the uh, the slight graphic design. Um, I'm actually thinking about this a lot. This is not our topic for tonight. But I, um, I've i been thinking about how, like, should I, if I should have, like, a cool word mark for my books, right? Like, oh. Marvel... It's really a cool word mark, right? That you just mm-hmm. see the Marvel, the red. Yeah. Uh, Disney has a really cool one because it's Disney as if written by Walt Disney, yeah. right? Like a lot of the, um, go figure, the corporations that spend a lot of money on this end up having- <laughs> Have a really good type treatment. Yes. And we just don't really have one of those. And- um, I have mm-hmm. a cool little DW icon I use for everything. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um. DW Dan Wells, not fearful symmetry though. You're not branding your. It's company. actually Darkwing Duck. <laughs> when there's trouble, you call DW. <laughs> um, so it's well, my homage to him. Um, I feel bad because I wanted to give uh Chat Chat. Yes. Some everyone go by Chat Chat. Don't let us making no. fun of their. It is very good bubble design. Uh, uh, in turn the you way. If you're universe- in Utah Valley, hit it up in the University Mall. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I've so tried yay. all the local places, and this is the one that that I feel tastes the most like the bubble tea I got in Taiwan. Well, it's so. very good. Mm. And there's three different kinds of like debris at the There's bottom, actually so. like five different types you can order. Mm. I just didn't give you all the options when I texted you because it was too many things like for my fingers to do. frozen yogurt place with yeah. gummy bears and mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff at the bottom. Yep, I love debris and drinks. This is something I picked up in Korea, and it's just not a thing we have done in America that much. But I suppose we are at least not on purpose. Yeah, (laughs) if you get debris in your drink, then my seven-year-old has had it before you. (laughs) (laughs) No, this is an exciting day, Dan, because what the this is the podcast is actually released to the world. This is the first time we've recorded an episode when people have already listened to the first two episodes yeah so, and hooray. i have listener feedback for us for some reason they're asking if we're going to keep intentionally blank as a title which why would we keep intentionally blank no as it's, a title we it's need not permanently blank no yes exactly and we didn't you know we didn't put it there because we wanted you to tell us what to i have no idea what i'm saying let's cut that whole we part were... out <laughs> we were not proposing intentionally blank as as a title. Yes, exactly. Um, I give you options in each episode for title, and you're not supposed to write your own in. They keep saying none of the above, which is a really dumb name for a podcast title. I don't know why they would want us to use none, none of, of the, the above. above. Yeah. 
Uh, at least no one's asking for all of the above. Eh, because that's true. that would be a very long title to a podcast. And it would get longer every episode. So our first podcast that we did, we've, we've mm-hmm. had two come out so far. Um, Popcorn Chur has beaten Stu Bad for the first well, round bracket. That's not surprising. Stu Bad is... In fact, a stew bad name. I think it's a great name. <laughs> I actually, you can see on my phone here, which one did I vote for, Dan? Uh, you voted for stew bad. I did vote for stew bad. <laughs> so, stew bad is down. And for our second one, which I do have to admit, um, were were better titles than we came up with the first time. They were um, bizarre anthropological phenomenon versus all hail Byzantrum. Byzantrinon. You can see what I'm. I, I'm. I'm batting a thousand. What did I vote for? All oh, hail, all hail Byzantr- People didn't like that one as much. No, bizarre anthropological phenomenon has has is also entering the first round um, of our our brackets. Like as I was listening to the second episode yesterday, I was thinking we 100 percent need some all hail Byzantrin on T-shirts or something. Oh yeah, that yeah. would be great. But it's losing. It's losing. It's losing. Byz- so. Byzantinon will be angered. You have unleashed his ire <laughs> upon the world, voters. What have we done? <laughs> mm. uh, if you guys want to participate, if you're not finding where to go this, I actually created a new subreddit for all of this. It's r slash Sanderson, which was, for some bizarre reason, available. Um, well, Brandon Sanderson is not. Someone okay. already has one but for Sanderson. That. But Sanderson... Nobody out there made r slash Sanderson. When Adam and I were looking for what, uh, you know, we were thinking maybe just, we couldn't call it Intentionally Blake because that's not the name of the podcast. So we couldn't yeah. get our Intentionally we, there Blake. There would be no point getting that one. No. Nope. It's surprising Sanderson was still available because not only is it related to you, mm-hmm. but maybe somebody wanted to make a sub- subreddit of Bernie Sanders on things. <laughs> just like pictures of him. <laughs> Planking. <laughs> Bernie Sanders flicking. <laughs> he could bring it back. Yeah. You know. Everyone everyone would go for that. Yeah, they I, totally I should would. say all the socialists would go for that. Not everyone would go for that. <laughs> um But maybe planking is is the thing that will bridge the partisan divide and heal our nation. An eighty year old man planking with the grumpiest possible face. So we did want to talk about food today. Yes. That was one of our things. Yes. Um, and it's part of why I'm okay drinking bubble tea. Do you drink bubble tea or do you eat bubble tea? You drink the tea and you eat the debris. Okay. Okay, I suppose. Like, Or maybe you drink the tea until it's only debris and then you eat what's left. Maybe. Like, what separates the fact that, like, if I just swallow the boba without chewing them, am I drinking the boba? I don't know. It also raises the question then of do you eat or drink cold cereal? Because it's basically the same yeah. ratio of liquid to stuff. Yep. I don't know. Mm. So have your tastes changed as you've gotten older? Uh, before I answer this question, I have to tell you one more important thing about bubble tea. Okay? That's the name of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so several years ago, It was actually while I still lived in Germany. Uh, I was invited to be the guest of honor, or a guest of honor, at uh, VCon in Vancouver. Mm. The other two guests VCon, based on the old classic television science fiction show, V, obviously, or VCon based on V for Vendetta. One would assume one or both of those things, and yet, apparently, it was just because it was in Vancouver. Ah, well. They they missed a trick on both of those things. Uh, yeah, at no point did anyone tear their face off and reveal themselves to be a lizard underneath. But uh, the other two guests were John Kabalik of, uh, yep. you know, Dork Tower. Also uh, original artist for Apples to Apples. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of people might know his and, artwork. Uh, Munchkin from and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And uh, Mer Lafferty, okay. who's a good old friend. Yep. And so the three of us were there and we were hanging out and uh, this was, this happened to be right at the season when Vancouver does its night market, which is this massive outdoor uh, Asian food stalls and, and gift shop stalls and tchotchke things. And so we all went there together, the three of us. 
and uh, there was a bubble tea place that had this big handwritten sign that said, uh, drink this and you will never regret. And I assume <laughs> that they left an it off the end. But Murr pointed out that if we drink it, we will never regret. Mm. And I know they were right because I didn't actually drink it and I have regretted it ever since. Uh, first time I encountered it, for some reason, all the stalls in Taiwan um, had this, it must have been a specific brand that had this logo. And part of the logo was a frog and it said in English, wow, real frog eggs. And then you get the bubble tea and you're like, <laughs> Are, really? Are you serious? I mean, so, yeah. I have eaten stranger things. So, you know. You walked through the whole market wondering why everyone was lined up to eat frog eggs. Or drink them, depending on your or definition. Drink them. Yeah. There needs to be a new verb that is both eat and drink. To Ooh, uh. to ink something or to dreet. <laughs> well, it can't. It can't be. It can't be ink. That already means something. That already means something else. Yes. Dreet so, just sounds terrible, though. So now own. I want to say slurp. <laughs> slurp is halfway between eating and drinking. Slurp is not a word I we came up with. Thereby decree. No, but I've just come up with a new definition for it. Oh, okay. I'm, I suppose I suppose that's not the most stupid bad idea I've ever heard. <laughs> um, okay, so life. anyway, you asked me something about food, which I cannot remember. What was it? <laughs> I asked you if your tastes have changed. If my tastes have changed, they have. Mm. There are things, first of all, when I was a child, and this is a weird thing about me, um... I was raised to eat everything on your plate. Uh, at least one bite of everything. You don't complain about your food. You eat it all. Man, did you actually, like, internalize that? I did. To, Can I have your mom visit my children? To an unhealthy degree I internalized Okay. That. And it was a few years ago, three, four, five years ago, that I realized I have become a big jerk. And we talked about this on our snobbery connoisseur thing. Um... But anyway, so so the the slightly different take on this topic is that uh, I kind of prided myself on just eating everything, and it's only been recently as an adult that I've decided, you know what, it's okay for me to not like stuff hmm. and not eat it. Like I can just choose to eat the things that I like the most, and I can still tell myself that the things that I dislike, I still like just not enough to to beat the things that I love. Wow, that's a very different arc in life than my arc <laughs> because taste changing. I have to separate the childhood era from the teenage era because the big shift happened for me when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if your kids are like this. I feel like a lot of kids are like this, but not all of them. Um, my kids will not try anything new. They mm. just... They will, and if you force them to, which we generally like, you have to try it, right? Yeah. Like Just one bite. Dallin will physically gag. Like he has mentally decided that this is, I guess, I don't know how you don't mentally decide. You decide non-mentally. He has convinced himself, <laughs> yes. mind over matter, mm -hmm. that anything new is horrific. And if he tries it, he will throw up. Like this is not just a kid. Like, he will have physical convulsions um, eating this food that we tell him that he should try. Yeah. And my other two are not as bad, but they have a similar sort of thing. And I can remember being that way. Like, what do I like? I like bologna and Miracle Whip sandwiches. <laughs> and the bologna is optional. <laughs> oh, my gosh. On Wonder Bread, I'm going to assume. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which has the same consistency as Miracle Whip. I can remember eating that. Um, and Byzantinon was happy. Let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> because I, like, and, you know, I had, like, these things I would eat. And I can remember the first time um, it was a sandwich. I was a teenager. We were on, like, a road trip or something with friends. And they went in to get sandwiches. And I put it in order for something very bland with no mayo. Mm -hmm. And they got my order wrong. And it came back and it was like a real sandwich. It was like roast beef and it was <laughs> mayo, not Miracle Whip. Mm -hmm. And it had like pickles and like good stuff on it. 
And I'm like, I'm so hungry. I'm just going to eat this gross thing. And I ate it. And I'm like, like something changed in me. Hmm. And I'm like, this is really good. Why have I never actually Why eaten a real sandwich? Real food before? You leveled up. I leveled up. And that's when I like started doing other things where I'm like, maybe all this other food people have been telling me is good all along is actually good. Maybe if onions are in things, they will flavor the thing. <laughs> um, and maybe this thing that, you know, that I've never been willing to try, this curry stuff is good. And mm -hmm. over the next 10 years, I just found all of these foods. I am glad that you had that awakening before mm -hmm. you lived in Korea. Yes. Because that would have been a rough go otherwise. Yeah. Or, you know, that might have been your awakening. That might have been. Uh, but by then, I was willing to try all sorts of things, and I'd mm -hmm. eaten. And, uh, you know, I got fed kimchi for the first time, and my response was not, my response was, hey, I've never had that flavor before. Yeah. And then really came to enjoy it. So That's I'm- awesome. Glad that that whoever got my order wrong when I was like fourteen and gave me a real sandwich. Um, that was Clarence the Angel from It's a yes, Wonderful yes. Life. He 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 got his wings. Um, Came down and said, yeah. hey, "Give this kid some pickles." They were spicy hot wings. Um, so I did not have. I, I was not a picky eater as a child. Uh, They're just a tiny handful of foods that I didn't like. And one of them was runny yolks in eggs. Mm. And it was maybe five or six years ago that I realized I had been missing out my whole life. I've become a huge runny yolk fan now. And I had a similar awakening, mm. but just for the one thing that I didn't used to eat. And I'm like, dang, this is incredible. Why didn't my grandma force me to try this more often? So I had a second kind of era of awakening. Okay. So the second era of awakening um, on foods happened. Like I liked a lot of different foods at that point, um, but I, you know, I was middle class, right? Um, I didn't go out to fancy restaurants. I had never mm -hmm. been. I lived in I lived in the suburbs of Nebraska, of Lincoln, Nebraska, and then the suburbs of the suburbs of Provo, right? Basically, <laughs> um, and so. Not the most co cosmopolitan places in the world. I had traveled a lot for someone my age and demographic, I, I think. Yeah. But regardless, um, then I started to become part of the publishing industry and started getting taken out to eat. And publishers take you to fancy places. Yes. Publishers are from New York where <laughs> but there's just let's let's talk a little bit about New York and big cities in general. This idea of like I have I have a philosophy. The random shop on the corner in New York generally going to be better than anything I can get here in suburbia. Um <laughs> probably true. This is because that corner shop in New York, when I say New York, I'm meaning like Manhattan, right? Yeah. Um, but even like big parts of Queens and things like this, right? Mm -hmm. That corner shop, the rent on that corner shop is so astronomically high that if your restaurant is not, and, and there's three on that same street and there's a hundred in the town. Yeah. Uh, town, Manhattan. That little town of Manhattan. <laughs> little hamlet. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, there are other options. Mm -hmm. And if you are not perfect, yes, there are 5,000 other places they can go in walking distance to get their food instead. Exception being the big tourist trap areas. So yeah. Times Square, I found this also mm -hmm. like in Italy, right? Rome has great food, but the further you get from the actual tourist traps, the better I found it to be. Mm -hmm. um, that, and maybe if you got out too far, they'd start getting bad again, right? Um, but <laughs> um, this is why there's a TGA Fridays at Times Square, so when you can go one block over and go to a diner that is just amazing. So there's a Goldilocks zone yes. of good food in big cities. But... Little towns, I have found. We talk about you know, down home cooking, little town, and the things like this. I have done and earlier in my career when I did uh, drove a lot on tour. Stopped mm -hmm. a little lot of little towns and like let's eat at the non chain place. Let's eat at their local, whatever. Most of these are terrible. <laughs> we have we romance them like dives and what things well, and there are some good ones. 
I, I but, think that the, the the romance we have given to small town home cooking mm-hmm. is not in a diner. Yes. It's mm-hmm. in grandma's house. Yes. And you know that if an old lady in a small town invites you over to eat, you're yes. going to eat well. Yes, absolutely. And there are like rare instances where something just is really good. But I have found that like I stopped at a lot of these mm-hmm. and they were universally terrible. So what's going on is I'm getting invited out by these people in New York whose standards for food quality and and flavor are just leagues beyond Mm -hmm. my understanding of what you can even get. Um, And then I'm starting to go to New York and just stopping places and being like, wow, these are the best dumplings I've ever had. Well, this is the best Italian food I've ever had. These are the best cookies I've ever had. There's a theme here. Um, um, and my taste started to shift as they started to take me out to a lot of these places. And I couldn't afford any of these places. But if you're just with the publisher, they're like, we're going to this fancy place. You're in town. We're taking you to the nice place. And what I found is um, my editor, your editor also at the time, mm-hmm. um, he would save up the places that he couldn't afford to go until an author was in town because he could expense it to the publisher and the publisher liked to treat the authors well. Mm -hmm. And so you'd go into town and Moshe would be like, all right, I've been wanting to go to Peter Luger forever. Uh, (laughs) You have to, you know, it takes you three months to get a reservation. Um, It has to be six months ahead and I've gotten us one and we are going to go and we're going to eat it. And it's going to be $300 a person, but Tom is paying. Um, And over time, this changed the way that I interacted with food. So uh, when I went to Bolivia a couple of years ago, uh, I was hosted by the embassy there because that's Mm -hmm. typically who will take an author to South America. Um, And so the guy that I was with, kind of the main embassy dude, uh, there is an incredibly fancy restaurant in La Paz, Mm -hmm. Bolivia. Uh, It's one of these that's like run by one of the most famous chefs in the world. Right. Uh, In fact, his other restaurant, the same guy's other restaurant is in Lima, Peru, and it is ranked as the third best restaurant in the entire world. Nice. And so he wanted to go to this place, and it was the same thing you're talking about with Moshe. Like, I've been planning for this. I can make the embassy pay for it. So basically, listener, your taxes paid for me to go to the swankiest restaurant in all of Bolivia. Um and you know we sat down and i had this other tv interview i had to go do but we had like an hour and we figured we're good uh and so we got through five or six of the courses and they were all the kind of super fancy highfalutin food that you're talking about and then the car came and i had to go off and do this interview and so he stayed with his wife and i talked to him the next day and i had missed easily three quarters of the courses they just kept coming and coming and the entrees and all kinds of things. And I missed all of it. Yeah. Those really fancy places are the ones without a menu. They just bring mm-hmm. you things. Um, yeah. I've eaten very few of those. Um, but I don't need like food like that. Right. I like it. I'm happy to go, but I'm not going to go to another restaurant and be like down on it. But what I do notice is now um, there is a wide range of quality even around me. And mm-hmm. I start to notice more the places that I just like better of the same type of food, which I didn't in my 20s as much, um, right? It was like, I want curry. Let's go get curry. Here is a curry place. Um, and yeah, this, is, this might be the most controversial thing I've ever said. Mm-hmm. I don't think that French food is amazing. I think food in Paris is amazing. And so <laughs> people therefore associate French food because Paris is the number one tourist destination in the world with being, and granted, there is, I mean, French, there's lots of really great French food, but the food in Paris is, is, is incredible. Mm-hmm. So is the food in New York. Like the, it's that big city thing. And to be a restaurant in Paris to compete, like I think that, anyway, that's my, that's my hot take. It's not French food. It's the fact that Paris is the number one tourist destination yeah. and the rents on these places are enormous and the competition is enormous and you have to make the best food, particularly because of the reputation of food in Paris. So that, yeah, like I have never had a bad meal in Paris. Just mm-hmm. you just pick one at random and they're all and just they're amazing. They're going to be amazing. In fact, 
Uh, if I were to catalog the best meals I've ever had in my life, mm -hmm. number one would be in Paris. Number there's, one there, for me was no probably in Paris. About it. And the thing is, it was a place that we picked randomly, forgot to write down what it was. I and know, it, I can't remember the name of mine either. Um, my number duck. two. I remember oh. that. It was amazing. Mine was like a lentil soup. You wouldn't think, right? No, I would not think that. It at all. just was incredible. Uh, my number two meal ever is uh, that I've had is the Lincoln Center restaurant in New York. That one I do remember. Um, it's an upscale Italian restaurant. That one. Uh, it's just at the Lincoln Center because we were there for Moshe. You know, loves the orchestra and the symphony and whatnot, and took us to New York Philharmonic, and we ate there on Tom's dime. <laughs> uh, and then went in, and it was it was amazingly good food. Yeah, uh, was the Paris thing also a uh, was it book related? Uh, I was there book related. I don't go places that aren't. But this was just Emily and I oh, okay. just walked out of our hotel and like said, well, let's let's eat that little place. Yeah. Well, let's just go to this. The, we want food here. This place is mm -hmm. it had like three tables as they often do. I'm exaggerating, but a lot of these <laughs> restaurants in Paris, like when I'm talking about the food that I really tend to like, it's actually not generally the high, high class. It's the low class or mid class in a really, really expensive area. Yeah. So you don't like, I really like uh, onion soup, French onion soup and steak frites. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you get that in Paris, it's just so much better. Yeah. Um, just like, Anyway. So so let me ask you then, um, and and I feel like we're that we're <laughs> that this is all coming across as very oh it's the rich authors talking about all the fancy food they eat yeah um, how much of it do you believe is experiential oh good uh, question because for example mm -hmm. one of the other meals I've had I don't know if this is a top five or a top ten or whatever yeah, but it's one of my favorite times I've had eating uh, is when I took my family we used to live in Germany. And Paris was like three hours away. So we were like, jump on a train. Let's go okay. see Paris. And this happened to be during the 2014 World Cup. Mm -hmm. And I took my son, uh, who was at the time, what would he, he would have been like 12 years old. And we just went downstairs from our hotel. And the two of us ordered a bunch of frites and a bucket of mussels. Mm -hmm. And we sat there watching a World Cup game in this kind of divey bar in the middle of Paris. And the food, of course, was incredible. But the experience itself of being with my son and being in this place and watching the game and, you know, kind of being surrounded by the community of, of European World Cup, um, absolute highlight of my life be because of that experiential aspect, more so than the food. I think that's a big part of it. I, I will admit, like being in Paris with my wife on a rainy day or evening that just you know that just enough rain that the streets shine um mm -hmm. and reflect the lights as you expect to happen in paris because of you know yeah. impressionists and things like that and this just the two of us no kids finding a random restaurant going in and having just a fantastic meal um there's there's an experience there that is enhancing all of that for me and going to the Lincoln Center restaurant, right? With my um, editor, this was after one of the books had just done really well. Um, and we'd planned this trip to New York and he was really excited and we got to go to the symphony and all of this stuff. It, it's definitely playing into it, right? Mm -hmm. I really like going to these places. And it's interesting that you say this because um, I'm comparing now my expectations for a meal with expectations going into a book or movie. And expectation plays a lot into this as well, right? When you know you're paying a lot and are expecting a lot, it can be dangerous because it can, it can be. be dangerous in the a meal that would have been a nine out of 10 any other day, only being a nine out of 10 can ruin the experience. <laughs> but yeah. at the same time, because you've been anticipating, because, you know, there's this, I don't know what it's actually called mentally. When you... It's 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 sunk cost fallacy, but there's an actual phrase for it when you pay a lot for something, and so you enhance how good it is in your mind because you've already paid this money for it. Um, and so, yeah. for instance, you know, paying a lot for wine does make the wine taste better when to people who pay a lot for yeah. wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it could either go that direction or the other direction. And the same thing happens to me with like stories. 
when some of my favorite movies, we've talked about Speed Racer at nauseum, right? <laughs> I knew that people were bragging on this film before I went. I did not mm -hmm. expect a lot. Um, a maybe even better example is Emperor's New Groove. I had heard that it was dreadful. I had heard really? that it was bombing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first week it came out and it, t it bombed, it right? Did. It did. Um, and that's all I knew about it. It was playing at the Varsity Theater on BYU campus. Yeah, baby. And uh, I had a date and that was the movie playing there. And I didn't have a car at that point. It's like, we go to this movie. It's the only it's one the playing. Only one we can reach. And so went to this movie and just loved it, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, Emperor's New Groove is is a one of those perfect movies for me, right? So I was yeah. expecting a 2 out of 10, and I got a 10 out of 10. Um, mm -hmm. And so it suddenly becomes one of my favorite movies when Lincoln, the film, is better, right? <laughs> to, in, in by my estimation of whatever okay. better means, right? Okay. Right? I, I think it's probably one of the best act performances an actor has ever given in a film that I've seen. Okay. Um, I absolutely, I, I love Spielberg. I love Lincoln, but I expected Lincoln to be at a 10 out of 10. You know what? It was, <laughs> but for some reason, Emperor's New Groove is like this thing that, uh, Emily and I always watch and we, we, you know, we yeah. love this movie because we both had that experience with it. Well, and if we can extend this food art metaphor a little further, uh, one thing that happens often is this idea of being told to eat your vegetables, right? Like, you know that the broccoli is the best part of the meal, that it's the healthiest, that it might have been prepared best, but you, what you really want is the steak that's on the plate next to it, you know, or you want the dessert that's coming after. And I guess this, this opens the larger question of what makes something great. Uh, is it enough to be purely enjoyable or does it also have to be important? capital I, um, because, you know, that's it's kind of what you're getting at with a comparison between Emperor's New Groove and Lincoln, which is not a fair comparison in any context. Nope. But, you know, you've got one movie that makes you happy and that you love it and that you can quote it ad nauseum and you'd probably be happy to watch it over and over again. Yep. Whereas Lincoln was, yeah, that was great. I am so glad I saw it. It was a transcendent experience. I'm good. I don't need to see this movie again. Yeah, and <clears throat> Lincoln may not be the perfect example of that because Lincoln is kind of funny at times and things. Schindler's List might be a better example, right? Yeah. Um, something like that that is um, is a movie that uh, that I'm very glad that I've seen, but I'm not going to put on all the time. Yeah. Um, and things like that. But yeah, like no, you've got to... Like, that, that was my experience with Requiem for a Dream. Like, I'm glad I watched this. Are you? I never watched I, that. I never want to see it ever again. Okay. <laughs> All I know from Requiem of a Dream is that the soundtrack remix made a really good uh, Lord of the Rings trailer at one point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the song from it, the main theme yes. gets repeated. I've had to actually ban it from my Pandora because it comes up on every instrumental channel I try to create. Well, and the problem with that, it's one of those ones that you ban it. I've done the same thing, and then it comes up again because it's been remixed because a thousand times. five billion yeah. versions of it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you you talked about your, your second favorite yes. meal of all time. Here's mm -hmm. my second favorite meal of all time. You ready for this? This was in Lima, Peru. Mm. I came home from Peru, an absolute Peruvian food evangelist, because I think it's incredible, and I would... You know, I, I want to write a whole book about it, except there's already a billion. Um, we went after an event one night. I was teaching a class or something. And then the, the publisher that had me there was like, OK, uh, you want to go to this place? It's kind of far away. Uh, and it was in the like the kind of bohemian hipstery part of town. And the only thing I knew going in was, yeah, this place was on Anthony Bourdain's show once. He came here. And it turned out to be like uh, this super popular spot where you go after you've been drinking because uh, it has really rich food. Uh -huh. um, you know, and so we just went after we'd been signing books and teaching writing classes. But it was just me and uh, some of the, uh, the booksellers that were hosting me there. And we had anticuchos, uh -huh. which are beef hearts that I had never had before, and they were incredible. 
And then we had a huge plate of chicken hearts, which were, again, super rich, hearty stuff. And then for dessert, we had these... Uh, was that intentional? That there was beef hearts and chicken hearts? No, that you called them hearty. Hearty? No, that was not. They, but both of them were very hearty. Um, which makes me suddenly wonder if that's what hearty means. Tastes kind of like a heart. Um, either way, and then dessert was... I can never remember what the, the Peruvian donuts are called. Uh, they're made out of like sweet potato flour, and I yeah. got them for you last yeah. time we recorded. And they're amazing, and they have some cool name that I don't remember. Anyway, it was just those three things. That was it. But uh, the experience was wonderful. I had never had any of those three foods. Uh, I mean, I had a bunch of chicken hearts before, but uh, not the anticuchos and not the, the donuts. It just changed everything. Like, I'll be chasing that high every time I travel to try to get something that good again. Best restaurant in the Salt Lake to Provo area. Ooh, best restaurant? Yeah, or your favorite and best could be separate. They might be because mm -hmm. of the uh, Emperor's New Groove principle. Yes. The Lincoln's New Groove. Ooh, ooh, that's a great theorem. name for our <laughs> the Lincoln's, New, Lincoln's Groove. New Groove. <laughs> <laughs> we may have just named our podcast. Yeah, um, vote for that one on the Reddit thread. Uh, okay, in the Salt Lake Valley or like in the... the the Rocky Mountain Bench here. Rocky the, Mountain the Bench. The Wasatch Front. Mm -hmm. um, Wasatch Front ooh. is a great, is a much better way to say it than what I said, which was like the Salt Lake Provo area thingy. So. <laughs> yeah, so from like Spanish Fork all the way up to Ogden. Yep. Um, I don't know. Valters is incredible. Valters it's a would really be my pick. expensive one. Mm -hmm. It's probably the highest quality mm -hmm. that I have come across. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, Blue Iguana. Uh, Blue Blue Iguana is good, mm -hmm. and it's a place that I take people a lot. Right. Uh, but I don't think. I mean, it, 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 there is a uh, really divey hole in the wall Chinese place called Mom's Kitchen. Ooh. That is phenomenal. I want to go there. I haven't been able to find a Chinese place I okay, really I like. I will take you there. Okay. It's the kind of place where the mom of mom's mm -hmm. kitchen is an old Chinese lady who doesn't speak English and who has claimed one of the tables in the dining room area mm -hmm. where she sits and like peels vegetables and stuff. And her daughter that does speak English is the, the hostess. Um, really, really wonderful. That was recommended to me by a friend and, and now I go everywhere. In fact... Uh, I've got a neighbor who often hosts, uh, he's a an importer-exporter, just like George Costanza. And he brings people in from China all the time, and he has to like take them out to eat and show them a good time. And I asked him to try this place, and he did. And his uh, group said, yes, bring us here every time. This is as good as what we can get in Shanghai. So. I need to go there. That is a really, really wonderful place. Um, yeah. I, I would probably pick that one as my favorite. That's good. Even uh, though Valters is, I think, you know, that's that's the Lincoln. Yep. Valters is definitely my Lincoln as well. There's a lot of good restaurants in Salt Lake, but there's something about when I discovered Valters and going with my family and that appetizer or pasta plate that they make just is incredible. I mean, it's it's 30 a bucks ravioli a piece things. for your appetizers, yeah. but it is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I really like, they've got a dessert there that is just, it's lemon gelato with honey on it, and it's like local honey, and it's so simple, uh, a little bit of salt, but I've been there really twice. Good. Okay. Once was when Mary Robinette Kowal mm -hmm. was in town, yep. and we wanted to take her somewhere nice, so mm -hmm. Don and I took her there, and got like really cheap stuff. Mm. And the other time was for a uh, one of our wedding anniversaries, where, you know, I did the whole nine yards, got like a sitter for the kids and we got a hotel room and we went down to salt lake city and did all this stuff uh and the the meal at Valters was more expensive than all the rest of it combined yeah but it was worth it we maybe we should do like a bonus podcast sometime from that hole in the wall chinese restaurant <laughs> where you and i just try different things have you ever had yin tai fong uh by chance it's uh it's a a Xiaolongbao place that's the soup dumplings 
Oh, no. um, that's from Taiwan. They've started to branch out into. Do we have a good soup dumpling place in Utah? No, oh, we yeah. have I a thought possible that's where you were going. one. Okay, but I was where I was actually going with this is I would I would move heaven and earth to get a Dean Tai Fong in Salt Lake. They've they're in Seattle. There's one in mm-hmm. Vegas now. Um, Adam went there, producer Adam, and took a picture of his meal and sent it to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's if I'm going to pick a favorite restaurant that is more than one location, right? It's mm-hmm. going to be Dean Tai Fong. If I like, uh, but that's not in Utah. So I'm going to actually pick Samhok as Ooh, my favorite. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, the, the whole Korean connection and getting Korean food that tastes is really high caliber. Mm-hmm. um for where we live like we're lucky in the wasatch front that i feel like we get a higher quality of restaurant than we should yeah i want to i be we, we're talking so much about how we can get better yeah. food in other places so i do want to put in just a little i guess plug for uh mm-hmm. utah food mm-hmm. we have we are predominantly white yep and no one is arguing that but uh, for various reasons, we have a an unusually high incidence of a lot of different cultures in relatively small numbers. And if you know where to go, you can find really phenomenal food. In and we have, I believe, I would bet, a higher than average appreciation of local cuisine as presented in the uh, the local uh, countries. Yes. Right. So. Yes. Um. In New York. I can get Korean barbecue that is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when I go to New York, I almost always go there. But Samhok is a family restaurant of the style that's just on the street corner in Korea. And, mm-hmm. you know, I should add a little asterisk to my um, discussion of food being better in big cities and things like that. There are certain things that I've found a given uh, region can just make really good no matter where you go, right? Yeah. Like, um, um, if you're in, in France, your baguettes and your croissant are going to probably be fantastic. Can you confirm this, Adam? You've been to the countryside, not as good as in Paris, or um, what do you think? I had almost the exact opposite experience you did with food in France, where, uh-huh. uh, inside Paris, I thought the food was fine. Uh-huh. Outside of Paris, the food was phenomenal. Uh, particularly the bread. Yeah. Like the bread is good everywhere in France. Yeah. Um, but um, and in Korea, your ma and pa uh, kimchi chige and bulgogi and things mm-hmm. are just really good. Granted, big asterisks. Brandon lived in Seoul, um, <laughs> right, and a little bit in Incheon, but mm-hmm. it was still good in some of the suburbs, the 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 provost, um yeah. of of that region. So having one here, I would pick as my favorite. Um, it's just it's a shame it's um a half hour drive or 40 minute drive from my house followed by generally an hour wait for your food because because it's a mom and pop shop yep, and that's what you get yeah and so i rarely find instances to be able to go get it these days yeah um i do like to uh no, take no, no. people out to eat though if you come to utah let me know dear listener i'll recommend a place so you heard it here. If you come to Utah, Dan is offering to buy you dinner. Don't at me. <laughs> we have no outro. <laughs>